is carrying the wall, carrying my tomb. The only one to hear my song are the coyotes and the wolves. But if I drink enough of this flask, I can hear them sing your song too. Hi everybody, this is Robert Leiterman. I'm here with Ian Carton, one of the Bluff Creek Film Site Project original members. And are you officially one of our Bluff Creek Project members as well? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, I, I intentionally asked years ago when we first started to you know, maintain a low profile. Right, because you don't publicly. want people thinking you were crazy. Well, oh, you want to be let's employed. just say, well, yes. Let's say that my, my home and professional lives have been up in the air for right. you know, several years. And just to speak plainly, when you know the inevitable googling of my name comes up, I was hoping that Bigfoot wouldn't be on the first page of results. <laughs> However, uh, I, I'm in a much more stable uh, place in life right now, and I am happy to take a more public uh, stance uh, on this issue. And you know, just the incredible work that the Bluff Creek Project has been doing now for ten years. It's hard to believe that. It really is because. Uh, I'm just getting younger. Uh, yeah, I don't know where the time goes. I hear you. Uh, <laughs> well, um, let's talk about where we're at right now because um, this is a new series I'm trying to do. It's a pretty much it's like a podcasting out in the field instead of being in the studio or calling you at home. Yeah, we told you to leave. I want you to leave the East Coast. Could drive all the way out here because we want to interview you at Scorpion Creek in in the middle of Bluff Creek Wilderness, basically. Yet not a wilderness officially, but it's a pretty wild place. So um, our adventure started when you arrived yesterday, and we pretty much hiked down to the film site. And once we got there, we had some other guys that were there that were kind of working on projects. Then we hiked a mile up from the film site upstream, passed through the bowling alley, passed a few of the old camps that were on the way up, and we made it all the way to Scorpion last night, just before the sun was going down. And that was a pretty tough hike, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. It was a push, especially with you know, 50 pounds of gear on. Yeah. Uh, but it was worth it. Uh, we've talked about doing this for years. Yeah, it's just our radio. We've got our radios out here because we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. And lucky for us, we have a direct line radio to our guys at the berm, 12 and 13H berm. So if things go bad, we can rate it to them and they can, you know, do accordingly. So, but there's not a lot of places in this canyon where you can actually do that. And we're lucky here. Rowdy flew over this last year with his drone. And you can see this big old open gravel bar from the air. And that's where we're at now. Yes, this is one of the largest gravel bars uh, we've seen yet on, on Bluff Creek, at least, you know, upstream from the film site. This is... Uh, you know, spectacular and that you can easily see it from the air like if I describe it right now it'd be there's a couple dead furs they've been dead for a while they're large furs on top of this level of the gravel bar this probably isn't the 19 I mean the big flood of 19 uh, but 64 64 flood because that, that terrace is kind of behind us up away but this is pretty open so this is pretty close to what it would have been like uh, when Roger and Bob were, were on their horseback and they saw Patty because if you look at this, all these big logs are sitting here. We have open area. We've been watching, uh, uh, looks like those lady fingers, California lady fingers, I think, or butterflies. Uh, saw some uh, um, um, swallowtails. And we, we got, we got, we've been watching the uh, a kingfisher back and forth this morning, make the ratchet noise back up. Uh, we got the creek here, there's a big swim hole in front of us. Uh, it's mostly exposed, so we're out in the shade under the trees because it gets pretty hot out in the sun here. But we're looking for a little dip in the creek and there's a big swimming hole in front of us on the other side. We're trying to buy a couple open terraces. Uh, we're at a junction where Scorpion branches off and goes kind of uphill. And the rest of the creek goes, continues on a big bend. So it really, it's great. 
I mean, yeah. it's cool in the shade, but you're still starting to warm up. You can hear the creek in the background. There's a breeze picking up right now. You kind of hear that as well. And so when we left the film site area, we hit the bowling alley and we walked up the bowling alley and on our left hand side, almost at the end of the bowling alley, there was this remnants of a camp. And you thought yeah. historically it was... Right, on some of the older maps, we've seen it marked as Ferris camp. Yeah. It's not on the current uh, USGS topo map of the area, but it's on some of the older maps. And, you know, as we hiked through yesterday, we could see why people would camp there. It's a good sheltered spot. There was even a bit of a seep, yeah. a spring coming in off the bank. Uh, so it's, I'm pretty sure that was Ferris camp. Uh, at some point, people met there for fishing or hunting or just recreation even. So you thought yeah. it was really maybe a traditional Native American uh, family camp section? It, uh, S Stephen Struford had worked on uh, on looking into that, and he thought it was a, a Native family's name. Uh, so... We saw it on a map, we saw it on a map, and we thought it was like right at the edge of the bowling alley, but actually it's at the end of the bowling alley. Yeah, we were pretty close to the north end Yeah, when we came out and found it, and it's, it's unmistakable. I mean, it, it's the only real gravel bar in the area. It's like I said, with the water source, it's a logical campsite. There's also another camp downstream, uh, uh, I should say upstream from 12 and 13. The bridge, 12 and 13 bridge, there's another camp upstream oh. somewhere. I can't think of the name of it either, but Stephen had those two camps. Yes. The one we were just talking about and the one farther downstream. Oh, yeah, I can't remember that name either, yeah. but he, I believe at one point he was uh, you know, proposing that as a spot where Patterson and Gimlin had actually had their camp. Yeah, well, according to uh, Barbara Watson, it was, it was a half mile up from right. the 12 and 13, current 12 and 13 bridge. Of course, that debate goes on. Yes, that's a whole other podcast. We've, yeah. we've been into that for 10 years. But, yeah. But it, it's it's certain that they had camped somewhere in that vicinity and ridden upstream to the film site. And now we are far upstream from the film site. That's affirmative. Uh, at a place, from what I'm looking at, uh, it doesn't get a lot of visitation. Uh, I've seen... No sign of, of any campsite or you know, any human activity. No trash whatsoever, no footprints. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's the way people should be leaving yeah, their campsites. Yeah, leave no trace. Uh, <laughs> not to open another can of worms, but she pointed out that this area does look a lot like the film site would have looked yes. in 1967 much more so than the film site actually looks now with 53 years of growth. Yeah, because like, like uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, when uh, Finding Benefit was filming, they're, they're, they only filmed the edge. They didn't even go to the upper sandbar because it was too dark and too overgrown. Exactly, you can't really capture anything on film back in there. Right. Uh, nothing dramatic that you could use on television. But here, here you, you could do, uh, you know, pretty good video interviews and uh, yeah, uh, you know, set up for well, basically whatever you want, including the drone flight we did earlier this morning. And the cool thing is, it's on a bend in the creek. It's exactly, it's on a bend in the creek. Uh, and not to interrupt again, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm always doing that. Right over here, where it makes a left-hand turn, it's a long straightaway, like a bowling yeah. alley too. So I just thought that was put that in there. It's just kind of interesting how it is here. But you don't think we should uh, restart the search for the film site again after 10 years? Uh, well, you know, it's farther upstream. Actually, no, you kept saying it's no, it's downstream. Exactly. And I think if I quote you, you said, next thing you know, we'll be up at Scorpion Creek looking for the film site. It seems I that think, the premise I of everybody... I think that is an accurate quote <laughs> from years ago, but back then I didn't realize just how much of a slog it was to get up to Scorpion Creek. Right. You guys have never gone this far. This is your no. first time. And yeah, this, uh, uh, this is, you know, furthest north, furthest upstream I've been. Mm -hmm. I've been to the top of the bowling alley yeah. uh, and, and 
just around it. To, you know, Did to you see that camp before at the top of the bowling alley? I must have gone right by it without really noticing. Um, all I can think of is that uh, that day I was wearing boots and just, you know, hiked straight up the creek yeah. the whole way and wasn't really interested in, in the sa sandbars or gravel bars. Right. Uh, but I must have gone right past that without really noticing the significance. And that was before we had found any of the maps that named a campsite there. Yeah, because uh, when we came up, it was Rowdy who went up and said, hey, check this out. Because mm -hmm. we were actually following the creek. It was getting late in the day. We wanted to get there. We were already tired. And then it's like, oh, it's just around the corner. It's like something I would say. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> but it, he said, check this out. And sure enough, but the disappointing part was that whoever had recently stayed there had left an open yes. privy, several places with toilet paper just all over the place. Yes, left little, some food particulates left behind. Yes, a lot of food too. And in addition to the toilet paper flowers, we used to call yeah. them. Yeah. They, uh, they just did not practice good camping techniques and you know, courtesy towards the people coming after them. Yeah, so how long do you think that toilet paper is going to be sitting around? Uh, I've seen you know, I've seen toilet paper in the same area. You heard that? that that's that's yes. a kingfisher just flew by. Just flew by, checking us out, wondering why there's people here for the first time, probably in forever. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that uh, that toilet paper can survive, depending on the climate, over two years. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, long might... after the human waste has degraded, naturally, the paper remains. So If that doesn't get people... washed away, but that's going to be here yes. all summer. Yeah. Well, I remember when uh, Stephen and I were at the film site in 2009, there was a film crew there that had uh, flown in by helicopter. Right. Because they did not know that you could drive to the site at that time or within about a quarter of a mile of the site. They to the Peter Byrne. To the Peter, Peter Byrne Exactly. Site. Yeah, you could drive to the Peter Byrne site, the bat boxes, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, they had chartered a helicopter and flown in in several trips, flown out in several more. But they left survey markers that were still visible the next summer. Yeah, uh, I, so, I remember. So they were not washed away at all. That's right. That's in 2010 uh, when I was down there with you guys. You guys showed me the blue flagging that was sitting yeah. on the gravel bar. Yep. Yeah, so, and, if, and I was surprised the flag was still there after the winter. Yes. Surprised me too. I assume that the water level got much higher in the winter, but it didn't look like it did that year. So let, let me let me ask you a few questions here because how long have you been looking for Bigfoot? I mean, it's why would a teacher <laughs> in a respectable job be out trying to look for a a, a, a cryptid? Well, I, I guess I have to blame my parents. Oh yeah, we always blame <laughs> our parents. Well. Um, as a young child in the 70s, uh, we'd lived uh, here on, on the coast, Northern California, near Eureka, and then uh, a little later up near Gold Beach, Oregon. Uh, and you know, the Bigfoot mania was still strong here at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, many of the TV shows that we know were just being produced then, in search of, etc. And the Six Million Dollar Man. And exactly, that six million dollar man episode with Andre the Giant as Bigfoot is still etched in my mind. It's burned in there like a computer hard drive. I don't think I'll ever forget that. <laughs> Childhood <laughs> memories. Yes. Uh, and yeah, supposedly there's a family picture with me uh, in Willow Creek in front of Jim McLaren's uh, Bigfoot statue. Yeah, uh, Jim McLaren. Uh, uh, he, he's a guy who's been involved quite a bit. And when did he carve that statue? He's been in some of the still photos taken by... Uh... Yes, I, I believe he carved it about 1970. But I, I, I'm not sure about that because he, I believe he left the area not too long after that. He was in the 1972 uh, photos. They used him for scale. Yeah. And, uh, but it, and he also visited the film site just about two weeks after the film was made. So. With Jim McLaren... I'm sorry, Jim McLaren was right. there with uh, Richard Henry. Yes. Yeah. And I, I've been, been fortunate enough to meet Richard Henry before he passed away. Uh, Jim is still going strong and is, you know, on social media. I think he's probably answered every question there is about the Patterson film multiple times. But uh, um, you know, he's still going strong. I think he's down in 
Ecuador or something like that. He's a butterfly. Exactly. He's, he's doing, you know, real science down there. But anyway, uh, back to me. Yeah, your interest in Bigfoot, eh? Yes. It, it stems from being a child in this area at the time when Bigfoot was making news. And you know, I have fond memories of seeing the uh, uh, one of the Bigfoot films, the one where they are riding into some remote area, supposedly of British Columbia, to capture the beast. And at the end of it, it comes in and ravages their campsite overnight and then takes off. Is this Forget a movie or is this an eyewitness thing? No, th th this was a movie. This was a, you know, an actual feature that got made. I can't remember the exact titles. Probably something like Sasquatch or something <laughs> or another. Ah, oh, we have visitors. Oh, it looks like we got some okay. people strolling yes. in here. And, hey, it looks like uh, somebody. Yeah, it's like members of our group. Jonathan? That's Jonathan, yeah. Uh, hey, Jonathan, we're doing, our, we're doing our interview right here, so we're, we're cool. Oh, you can talk. We're, we're just you know, talking along. Yeah, it looks like Jonathan's joined us. He was pretty much with the group who came in earlier staying spending the night last night over at the uh, film site you, man. yeah we didn't know if they're gonna make it all the way up or not such a long walk but okay back back to the interview portion of it yeah so um so you got involved as a kid you were interested in it and and this film site thing yes. i mean did you know that in 2003 it was misplaced <laughs> i actually did notice that uh i was uh, living on the East Coast at the time, yeah. but following Bigfoot on the internet. And it did strike me from the 2003 Willow Creek Bigfoot Symposium yeah. that no one could seem to point out any actual landmarks. And you know, except for us, everyone who was anyone in Bigfooting was there that weekend. Yeah, there's a whole list of things. And, yeah, and they're also filming a episode because Yes. Uh, because uh, uh, Bob Gillen was there, and after they were done with this, well, how does Stephen describe this? The big confusion of 2003. Three, yes. They, they went later on and they did episodes for the show with that moneymaker, Autumn Williams. Uh, a few other people were also there as well. Right. Evidently, I found out that Bobo was behind the scenes guy, almost like the film scout that what Rowdy does today for that shooting up there. And he says he first saw the site in uh, uh, two th uh, 2000, no, no, I'm sorry, 1988. Oh, wow. I mean, that, yes. 1988, that's, that was a long time ago. Yes, but he's, you know, he's a local. He knows this area. And, uh, yeah, and as it would turn out, you know, Bobo and Cliff were pretty much spot on. Uh, yeah with where the site actually was but it but anyway it, my story yeah. is 2003 notice that there's a conspicuous lack of photographic evidence of where the film site is right even though everyone's talking like they're there um so i think hmm uh at that point in 2003 i had one set of gps coordinates uh that had been provided on the internet by todd niece who had visited uh, with Peter Byrne and obviously felt that the film site was the Byrne site. Right. Which the GPS coordinates give you the exact end of 12N13H. Boom, right there. Which is convenient. It is awfully convenient. A little too convenient, I thought, but, you know, Byrne was definitely here. The photographs prove it. He knew the location. These are several well, times. Yes. Uh, and so there's absolutely no doubt about that. Anyway, so forward a couple of years. Yeah, so you have an interest, you've heard about it, yes. and we're 2003, and were you here for the symposium in 2003? No, I was not. I was still living on the East Coast. Uh, in 2006, however, uh, I moved, quite by coincidence, to Redding, California. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was still relatively early spring, but I tried to get up uh, to the film site. Uh, I had to stop about, you know, six miles in, maybe eight, where it, even with four by four and chains on all four wheels, the right. snow was too, still too deep in April. I guess it was late April. And uh, 
So we went, went back to Reading and on with life. And then in the fall of 2006, I was finally able to... Is somebody digging down here? Uh, we think it was a... a An elk, elk followed by some deer, small tracks. Yeah. yeah so we're actually... We're going to interview. Hey, guys. So we had other people join us from our group. Alan's here and... Lewis. 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 Sorry, man. I, I'm sorry. Yes. I remembered Alan, so... <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the rest of the crew has joined us here. So, yeah, we're working on a uh, podcast for the uh, Bluff Creek Project. So I wanted to do in-the-field interviews, so that's kind of what we're working on. Yeah, we've done a few so far. We did a drone shot already, did a bunch of drone stuff. But, yeah, uh, Scorpion is that last creek you passed. Okay. This is the rest of, of Bluff. And ironically, it looks like the film site. And there's a bowling alley at the end of this that oh. continues straight. And this is probably what it'll look like, you know, 1967. Right. Oh, so, so uh, to, uh, 2000, 2003, uh, fast forward, you're teaching, you, you end up living in Reading. Yes, and uh, after several non-Bigfoot-related camping trips, although any camping trip a real Bigfooter goes on is always a Bigfooting camping trip. That is so true. We always have the cameras ready. But yeah, I'd done several trips over that summer. And uh, finally, I had a free weekend that happened to coincide with October 20th. Mm. Film day, as I call it. It's yet to be recognized as a federal holiday, however. Yeah, well, you never know. Uh, well, when I'm in office. Okay, good. So, uh, so yeah, uh, October 2006, I drive out. You, the uh, you know, the road was still open down to the burn site. Drove down there and ended up meeting Daniel Perez, uh, creator, editor of the Bigfoot Times. Yeah. And he was there with Richard Henry, also one of the original eyewitnesses. And the guy who drove drew a, a map in yes. 2000. Was it 2004? Four, he drew the map. I believe Press. it was 2004 that it was published in Bigfoot Times, and this was Daniel's follow-up to that to okay. actually come out onto the ground with him yeah. and see what they could find. And so I was lucky enough to join them, and uh, we basically hiked to what we would call the consensus site. Consensus, the general consensus. Site. Yes, general consensus site. Uh, at no time. Did we get, you know, upstream far enough to the actual film site, as we're sure it is today? Uh, but it, it was a great experience, and uh, you know, got to see uh, what the area looked like in fall. Uh, got to see, you know, just the <laughs> limited hours of daylight you have at the bottom of the right, canyon, especially that time of on year. October twentieth. Yes. And uh, otherwise, you know, I had a great trip, great weather and you know, met real Bigfooters. Uh, and from there... When you say, I'm starting to rub, but you said real Bigfooters, who did you meet there? Well, what, Daniel Perez. You met Daniel Perez. Perez now. Right. Now, Richard now, Henry. Was Daniel Perez with Richard Henry? Yes, he had brought him there. Okay. And um, where did you see them at? Uh, they were camped right there at the burn site. So there is a fire ring that's been there for years. Yes. And it used to be an old corral somewhere around there as well. Uh, Mr. Henry mentioned that. And, um, and so... Just, uh, but we couldn't find any sight of it. Right. So at that moment, Daniel Perez and Richard Henry, did they say, hey, the film site is over here? Did they ever talk about that? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't believe that Mr. Henry specifically stated a location. Okay. But uh, Daniel was quite sure it was the general consensus site. Okay, that's the so just describing for the people listening, that's just past the gulch. Yes, that's that big erosion area where that creek puts in. Exactly, and, and the first big old open gravel bar there yes. on the way to Dehendizet. Yes, and I, that concerned me at the time because with all of that erosion, with those landslides, yeah, you know, the, any definitive you know, tree or stump could have been long since swept away. Uh, and we'll like it with 2003, you know, no one could pick any definite landmarks or points of reference. It was hard. Um, I mean, uh, 
Evidently, I interviewed Bobo uh, last weekend over at uh, Twin Lakes, and he had mentioned that uh, he had went upstream with Gimlin. And when they got to the Jehendon's X area, he said that looked really familiar. They walked up the, the bowling alley, and Renee, I mean, not you know, Renee, I mean, uh, up the bowling alley, but uh, Bob said, hey, man, I, I think this is pretty much, I rem remember, you know, crossing up this, you know, going up the hillside. So, he was pretty sure during the interview back then that that was a location. But I don't remember them saying anything about walking on to the actual upper sandbar and looking at trees, but it was just following up the creek. That's my recollection too, with what was being published and talked about right. online at the time, was that they were quite certain that was the area. And by the way, that just shows extraordinary memory. It, yes. Because I would, I would never remember a place that by the geography that well, especially considering it's completely overgrown and has been for decades. So, so um, but let's talk about since we're the Bluff Creek at the time, Phil oh, yes. How in the world did you meet up with Stephen Strait? Okay. Uh, coincidence of parking. <laughs> Uh, in the spring of 2009, I uh, wrangled an invitation from Tom Yamaroon to the uh, Bob Gimlin Roundup tribute in Yakima, Washington. That was 2009? It, that, that was a 2009 yeah. event that I, I went to. And I have to thank Tom for that because... Yeah. Uh, Tom Yamaroon. Yes. He... Uh, he was very generous and offered an invitation on the basis of just a few posts on the old Bigfoot forum by myself and a, a you know, brief telephone conversation. So I uh, you know, packed up and headed up for the weekend and I ended up basically parking and camping. On one side was uh, Canadian investigator Tom Steenberg, mm -hmm. who's written several books and is you know, d definitely one of the best of the best. And on the other side was Stephen. <laughs> and uh, uh, over the course of the evening, we got to talking and realized we were from the same general area of Northern California. And we also had the same interest in the exact location of the film site. Uh, and we're you know, both pretty astounded that you know, no one could provide you know, definite GPS readings, coordinates for it, or specific landmarks. And this is because you guys are at Yakima Roundup, yes. and you guys have hooked up, and you're talking about this. Yeah. And uh, so by the end of the weekend, we had planned a trip down here or, uh, together. And uh, we made several trips that summer into this area. And then over the winter, I guess, uh, Stephen, who already knew you, right, uh, you know, uh, decided to introduce me. <laughs> and so, by I guess by the spring of 2010, we were talking about yes, you, know, you coming in primarily to film uh, our little rants. <laughs> yeah, because because I I didn't I didn't really officially meet Stephen until 2007. At the uh, big event at the uh, Veterans Hall Memorial in Willow Creek, I think it was the 40th or 45th anniversary. It was anyhow 2007, and that's when I met Stephen, and he was doing an article for uh, North Coast Journal. And then I we had our talk about the film site at Laos Camp when he joined us there, when the crew was there, and that's the same time that I was taken to the big tree areas uh, by. Um, Cliff Brackman, and I think Bobo Fay at the time, because Bobo never took me that far up. And so it was overgrown. I just saw a bunch of big trees. I can't remember where it was, but that's the time period we're talking about right there. So, so um, at this point, I'm just the guy who's going to do your video work for you, which really could care less about the existence of a film site. I'm only there because I started doing videography work. And I said, what a great opportunity to film some, to film some experts, you know, as they move along the creek to find this place that's missing. 
or um, misplaced rather. And so, so I first get to meet you in 2010. Uh, I had been there. I'd been in the Laos camp for a couple of days, and I'd really walked up to up towards the uh, uh, Peter Byrne, a big tree, and back out, and it started to rain on me. And so the next day, I got to meet you. That evening, I got to meet you officially. And you whipped out some of these maps, the, the uh, Richard Henry map, and a couple of them. We had a long discussion. No, that was later on when, uh, when Rip was with us. But I got to meet you guys for the first time, you for the first time, and it rained like hell for like three days, and we were out looking for film sites. Yes, it was a memorable trip, definitely. Uh, and for, for your you know, listeners at home, rain in the summer in Northern California is extremely rare. I mean, you can almost count on six months of sunshine. <laughs> and this is mid-September, <laughs> yeah. and it's raining a lot. And uh, I have to video under an umbrella. Yes, I remember you had, you had a poncho on and an umbrella to protect the camera and still managed to, you know, follow us along as we went yeah. over and under <laughs> and through just about everything. It was uh, quite a trip. I remember you had that yellow reflector thing on your vest. Oh, uh, yeah, you I had a flat. yellow uh, rain cover for my backpack. Yeah. I followed that over logs <laughs> through the creek, trying to stay close up to hear you guys talking. Pitter patter of rain on the umbrella is getting wet. Stephen wasn't even dressed appropriately, if I remember rightly. You, the I called you the Boy Scout, but you were dressed. Yeah, you prepared. I had enough to get by. I yeah, wore wetsuit pants. Full, I was in full Gore-Tex, but yeah, a wetsuit might have been just as appropriate that day. And Stephen oh, was God, wearing rubber boots, I want to say jeans, and a, a hoodie. I don't think it was a raincoat. <laughs> yeah, and he, he was wet. But he kept, you know, he kept kept on going. He went, not a single complaint. He was even taking smoke breaks in the rain. <laughs> That was impressive. That's true. All 356 of the smoke breaks we took that trip in the rain. Yeah, so, so yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Now, we did a lot of work. We yes. did the investigation. But you kept saying, you know, I really think the film site is downstream. Okay, yes. Uh, at the time, there were two different things going on in my mind. Uh, one was that I was worried that we were forcing uh, the film site to be further upstream than it really was. And especially with all these uh, landslides in the area, it could easily have been destroyed and we could be trying to force fit the film site into an area that wasn't true. Um, the other is a little more complex and that is that you know, I believe the Patterson film is genuine. It does show a Sasquatch. But then we also have to look at the film as a whole. And there's a lot of legitimate questions about the film. You know, specifically, you know, how did they get the film developed? How did they get it from, you know, Northern California back to Yakima? Uh, you know, how was it developed so quickly to be watched that weekend? And one of the things about the history of the film is that after they took it on the afternoon, or presumably very early afternoon of the 20th, they then rode their horses, after collecting their spooked horses, they rode their horses back to their campsite, got materials like their plaster, came back to the ca or film site, shot a second roll of film of them plasting casts, uh, uh, pouring casts, pouring casts, etc. Filmed that, did some demonstrations to show the, how deep uh, the footprints went compared to their own, etc. They did all of this. Then they returned to their campsite again and went into town to have the film shipped somehow. Right. So, one of my main reasons for wanting a film site further downstream is that it's closer to their camp. And it's easier for them to have done all of this in the time available. Because, yes, they still have to make it from the middle of nowhere here in the Six Rivers National Forest right. to either a post office and or an airport. To mail that thing. To mail that thing Friday 
evening. Friday, late Friday. Exactly, late Friday. So the further downstream the film site is, the more plausible that timeline is. But in general, I had no particular film site picked out downstream. I'd had a couple of things, a couple of you know, more open areas that are now completely covered you know, with alders and other growth right. under 50 years old. I had a couple places I had been, but I wasn't like married to any of those. It was more just the general idea. And of course, my first visit to the to this area, I was there with Daniel Perez and and Richard Henry, and they had obviously been to the correct film site at some point in the past. Right, this is and, photographic evidence. Right, and, and uh, Perez, Except for Perez. Uh, well, Perez apparently had met both uh, Bob Titmus and Rene De Hinden at the film site uh, in years younger, because he'd been. You know, his first newsletter he started when he was a teenager. Yeah, it has been... Uh, so that was obviously some time ago. So, uh, you know, you, you have to give some deference to the eyewitnesses who were there, even if it was decades ago. So that's my, you know, explanation for the interest in staying downstream of mm -hmm. the burn site. Uh, and, yeah. and when we did walk the creek that day... Right. Uh, we did find some interesting large open areas. Yes. And we also had some photographs uh, from the early 70s uh, to maybe a few from the late 60s, early 70s, which seemed to suggest that you know, there was an open area behind the film site. Right, you, uh, you always talked about the backlighting. And exactly, that was the backlighting thing. was a big issue at the time, but uh, I think a lot of that may have just been artifacts in the copies of the photos we were mm -hmm. using, which were at that point all printouts right. from copies the internet. Of copies. copies of copies, sometimes of copies. Uh, so the, the backlighting, I think, has not turned out to be as important as I thought at the time in 2009 and 2010. Uh, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that we have found the correct film site. The trees, the yeah. stumps, the distances, the location of the creek, right. everything adds up completely. And I've been convinced of that since 2012, absolutely. Yeah, because I, I remember in 2000, it was October 2011, uh, um, we were moving along. We decided to make our final grid on the one that made the most sense to us. You were still a little hesitant. You had some good points you brought up, but we said, okay, we're going to do it. So right before we started the grid, um, you had family family obligations to come up, so you, you missed when. Uh, so I pick up Rowdy to replace you. No, 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 no hard feelings, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, I I do regret missing that weekend, yeah, especially uh, because that was the critical weekend. Uh, but we got Rowdy out of it. Yeah, we got so, Rowdy out of it. Uh, you've had ten years of uh, of great work from a really accomplished. Uh, you know, videographer, outdoorsman, and now licensed drone pilot. Yeah, the good old Rowdy. So he pops up. He helps me with the with the grid. He helps me with the you know north south axis, east west, divide into thirty foot sections, walk through and draw in artifacts. And I, I I wanted to get that done in 2011 because a I want to make sure I'm right, and and I know you agree with that, and b we wait too long, somebody else will say, oh yeah, we found it. And so you kind of want to get it done, but before I say Robert Leiterman is associated with this project, and here's my final answer, I want to make sure it's kind of right. So I came back on the uh, uh, the weekend of uh, Halloween, and Roddy couldn't make it, Steven could only give me four hours, so I did the final touch-ups and created it and took it home, and over the next couple of days made this grid map. And then we, we were pretty excited. That, at that moment, when you take the grid map, compare it with the 71, and I drew in and marked them A through Z, all the artifacts, that's when Perez got on board. Before we were like just confused guys. But once <laughs> Perez saw that, he goes, oh, I agree, you guys got it. So then that December, we got it. We got to get even. We got to get Ian on here. We got to get Ian's input. So you came down and met in Willow Creek, and we went to the Bigfoot Hotel in a room, and we went over that, and we were, were so frustrated because 
you were still saying, you know, I feel more comfortable with something farther downstream because you didn't go with us when we did the grid search. Exactly. So uh, I wasn't convinced until I was, you know, there on the ground again yeah. in the summer of 2012. But you know, with the grid map there on the ground, it's, it's absolute. It, it makes uh, a yes. difference, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it sure does. And uh, One of the things about the Patterson film that, uh, as Bill Munns pointed out from his analysis, where he's actually been able to uh, physically examine most of the known copies of the film. As many listeners will know, the exact uh, camera original, the yeah. positive that was in the camera's location is unknown. Uh, but Munns has examined most of the copies that are in existence. And he can tell looking at them when the camera has been stopped and restarted because there's a slight difference in the exposure. Right. And uh, from that, you know, Munns has deduced that the camera was stopped and started several times. And just from watching the film, you can tell that Patterson is moving and is filming from several different locations. And you have to sort of recreate that in your head or ideally in a model on paper and realize that you know, the film side is not perfectly linear. Uh, and that was one concern that you know we needed a site that was big enough to contain all the action that you see in that film, which is presumably about 60 seconds runtime. And of course, you know, on TV, you generally only see about five seconds or so right. in the middle around, around the 352. Frame. Right. But you know, the, uh, the creature is actually at quite a distance at the very end of the film and is disappearing into a stand of trees when, um, coincidentally, the film runs out and yeah. you end up with, with the, watching the end leader of it. Um, so that was a concern, you know, that, that we needed an area that was large enough and flat enough. But then you had to figure in, you know, all the changes of position of Patterson and the creature while this is going on. So I was actually looking for a slightly larger uh, film site uh, than, than the actual one. That was, and you know, that didn't necessarily have to be downstream, but for the reasons I stated earlier. Yeah, we wanted a wider area to exactly, fit it all in. We wanted a wider area to fit it all in, but there's no question about that. I mean, we were there with Munns yeah. when he did his on-site work. And that was in 2012. That was also, yes, July. that was 2012. Uh, and of course, he wrote a great book when uh, Roger met Patty, yeah. uh, and it's available on Amazon, and it's a great read. He's you know, the expert on the film right now. Does he mention us in that book? I think we're mentioned. I, I'm not sure if we're all mentioned by name. Or by guide I, service? I, yeah, I think we're... Uh, the guide service that uh, brought me to the film set. I, I think we're... I think we're in the the thanks at the end. at the very end, but I I don't remember. I know my name's not mentioned anywhere in it. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you, Stephen, Rowdy, and Jamie are, oh. who were you know, by that time. You know, you, you were the the project. You were the Bluff Creek project. Yeah, that, that was pretty much in because we brought him down in 2012. Um, he had been wanting to go to the film site for years. He finally had somebody to bring him down there. The amazing thing is is he come up with what he did by watching the movie. Mm -hmm. He come up with a chart, a graph he drew in. He, he kind of speculated where this took place, where this took place. And the first day was interesting watching his expression on his face when he looked up at the trees. And the next day, he was had a project of his own where he was trying to determine where Roger Patterson was in frame one, where Patty was in frame one, and where Roger Patterson's 352 position would be. Yeah. And that's what we kind of worked on when we were up there. Yes, and it, he did incredible work. And I mean, there was an entire team of volunteers there. Yes, for, uh, for 17 people. Yeah. Not, not, not counting, um, uh, I forget the gentleman's name who passed away, but he stayed at site because his health was infected to go up there. It's all in the book. Yes. I encourage everybody to read the, read the book. Yeah, the one that's going to be out. Uh, yeah, it's, I'll do my, my plug for the book. It's called, it's called The Bluff Creek project a journey of rediscovery of the patterson gimlin bigfoot film so we should have that out by october no later than november of 2000, 2020 and that'll be out and a lot of these stories are in it and the process of going through it okay commercial over for that so um, also after 2012 
we got involved with a project that we weren't planning on because right after we finished at the, um, the, the site, um, we headed back, right? We kind of staggered. It was, it was Perez, my son, and you, and I. Oh, yes. And we headed yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. We went to the Mexican restaurant after we ate there, and then we went to Stephen's place. And then we said, let's go to the bar. So I'm not much of a drinker, but we went for social aspects. So we, we ended up at the local bar there in Willow Creek on a Saturday night, if I remember rightly. Or was it a Sunday night? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have the dates, but I don't remember the days. So anyhow, it was not too crowded. We're in there. Um, uh, uh, Cliff Rackman's there. Flippy's there. Uh, you and I were there. Stephen was there. Uh, Todd Hale was there. Uh, Terry Smith was there. And there goes my memory you know, at the moment. Anyhow, so we're, we're in the bar. We're just kicking back. And this lady comes up to us, Amy. And she goes, hey, would you guys want to be extras in this movie we're going to film in the bar? So she handed us this two-sided piece of paper, and I, and I'm not the best reader, you know. So, uh, yeah, well, what do you think? Yeah, it'd be kind of fun. So the disclaimers. Uh, so we're reading those things, and uh, actually, I think you read it. And I go, "What does this say?" You say, "Well, it just says we're gonna, you know, allow them to shoot our, our likeness and images." I, I go, "Okay, we'll do it." So we walked over to the edge of the bar where she directed us. We sat right there and we watched this dude show up with the, and stand on a table and play ukulele and sing a Bigfoot song. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did, did I miss anything? No, it, you captured the moment. It, it was rather surreal to be sitting there and, and yeah, the L.A. hipster looking dude comes up and starts playing yeah, uh, on a, a table. Bigfoot song. Yeah, right there at... Uh, Oh, I forget that bar's name, but that was Timmy. That's yeah, Timmy. Yeah, the, 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 Timmy is his name. I was Timmy trying Red. to remember which. Uh, it's one of only really two bars at the time in Willow Creek. Right. <laughs> but after that was over, we oh that's cool. So yeah. what did we do after that? We went over to our, back over to the little mini bars by the or the islands by the pool tables, <laughs> and there and there is after that was all done. It was uh, Todd and. Uh, Terry were drinking and talking to Amy and then um, as I walk up Amy go, uh, uh, Terry goes this is the guy I was telling you about and so I'm thinking to myself what did I get signed up for so evidently they're looking for a guide to bring them to a place to film and she had these basic specs a place that, that's not too far away scratch that one <laughs> a place that gives a wild a, f a feel a place that would be good it's beautiful and and i go well i i might know of a place you know after some extensive talking to her i might know of a place and when i said we'll take you there what i really didn't really think about when i said we i meant ian and my son <laughs> and i will take you there so we drove stopped the guy blackberries and went out there. So, so, almost forgot the part where we actually got to meet Bobcat. Because yeah. you said, uh, uh, Bobcat, he's that dude over there at the bar. And I go, I could not pick him out. I go, who, who's Bobcat? And so you had to explain to me, do you remember the uh, Academy movie many years ago? <laughs> well, he's one of the, the cadets. And, and I, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, I got, he came over to us and introduced himself yeah. and chatted with us. Yeah, there's uh very nice guy and genuinely interested in Bigfoot. Yeah. And you know, definitely impressive thing to do to come all the way up here to film, uh, even though they could have easily filmed within a couple hours drive of L.A. And they kind of did you out of Big Bear a little bit. Well, they, they had to do yeah. a little work there, too. But, but they did come up here. And, uh, yeah, they, you know, they had an interesting story to tell. And it was a fun experience. But... Like you said, you know, basically it was, uh, you know, we'd just come back from almost a week yes. out at the film site. Making history. And, yeah, I've been in town for less than a day before we turned around and left the next morning for a couple to come more days. right back out to Laos Camp. But yes, the summer of 2012 was a very busy one here. And, I mean, just in general, when I think back, Almost every time I have come out, or at least once a summer, 
when I've come out to Laos Camp and the film site, there has been some other organized event, usually a, a, you know, filming, going right. on. Uh, for instance, the, the very first trip with Stephen in 2009, as we're driving down the road, there's a helicopter hovering overhead, you know, delivering the last group of the uh, camera crew that would do, I guess, a, forget what, it, it aired on National Geographic Channel, I forget the exact title, but um, yeah, and since then there have been multiple other, you know, filmings out mm -hmm. here that I wasn't involved in, uh, but yes, yeah, so helping with uh, Willow Creek. Yeah, the, Will was, the movie. Yes, <laughs> Willow Creek, the movie. The movie. Uh, Bobcat. What was quite a joy. Yeah, uh, that was an experience because... We sat around, once we brought him up there, we sat around for a while waiting for them to do something. Yes. <laughs> I finally, we just go, oh, are they going to do anything? What do you guys, you guys want to do any locks? Well, how about some calls and stuff? And that's where I got drafted into doing calls. Yes. And we taught Timmy how to do cool knocks. And then they filmed the tent scene right there at the entrance. And the lost scene, the skinny dipping scene, the bunch of stuff. And so it was great experience. Uh, we, did, we couldn't stay till the very last part because, you know, we have, we have lives to live. But it, it was a great experience, and uh, I, I, sometimes I almost forget, but you were right there with me the whole time. Yes, you ended up being the, the Bigfoot technical expert and staying up half the night filming with them, yeah. most of the night, doing the, that tent scene, which is uh, it, it's one of the best parts of the movie because the, those two actors are basically improv that entire scene, and it almost looks like it was done in one take. But I know it wasn't. No, actually, uh, it was one take. It was one take. The oh, whole well. thing was one take. Yeah, they, they did a great job. Yeah, and uh, I, I was basically, uh, you know, holding down the campsite since, you know, among other things, they'd brought like you know, one little container of bottled water for, for the weekend. It just wasn't nearly enough. Oh, I mean, they were yeah. not prepared, and they <laughs> they weren't dressed for it. No. They scratched everybody in the like two tents. Yeah, exactly. The, the tents were brand new. The sleeping bags were brand new. Just bought it. Exactly. Price, uh, little price tag still on. Yeah. Uh, but. Hey, were you there when the angry the guy who played the angry man showed up? Angry. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, he showed up in a little tiny white smart car. I kept thinking it was blue. I can't remember the color, but it was small. Uh, it, 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 it may have been bluish or you know something, but yeah, it was a tiny little smart car driving down the the road into Laos Camp. It's like slightly out of place. Perfect for renting in downtown San Francisco. So not quite so much for the uh, backwoods of Humboldt County. So what was that guy thinking? I'm just going <laughs> to drive up this little road here, and I'll, I'll do my, I'll do my part for this movie. And so hours later, not seeing a single soul, based on the directions I gave Amy to give to him, he comes putting up, and he is mad and fit to be tied. <laughs> Why don't you tell me it was this far out? Now that I, so he was all upset. Then Bobcat comes walking over, and as soon as Bobcat shows up. The seas part, the world is peaceful. Yeah. Anyhow, it, it was an interesting shoot. I appreciate that. I was I was all fun and bragging rights and I have those to my calls and that one. And you know, I can always say now as as my, my reference, I yeah, I, I helped I helped to help help with the filming of a movie and stuff. Which and is, you know. and we are visible in the bar scene. Oh, that's it, a well. It, in the film, well, when uh, when D Timmy's doing the Bigfoot song yeah. there in the bar, you can see. Uh, both you and I well, are at the bar, just off to his, or just off to camera left. I yeah, guess. we're off to left. Actually, yeah. let me rephrase that. You look really good. It's a nice side profile of you not you know, getting with the music. Me, you see that this little ball spot like right in the top back of my head. It's like right there. You know, <laughs> I can't even tell him there. Yeah, but but you 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 look good. So and that was more than five seconds of fame, man. I, hey, I, it was almost that, you know. The, I might have been on camera almost 10 seconds. It's the whole length of the song because it, it was basically a lost, oh, a found video program. So yes. that little high def camera, they, they're not moving around. It's not like four cameras making the shot. It's that single camera. And they're holding it while it's filming. And they're watching the whole thing. They're watching your beautiful site profile. And Timmy on the table strumming away, singing a big trick song. He actually made like the night before. I heard that. <laughs> That's good for him. I couldn't have come up with something that fast. That's for sure. And no one would pay to watch me sing it. <laughs> uh, well, you don't know. You never know. You never know. Hey, so so 
Um, now you're with the Bluff Creek Project. You're, you're here helping us out with this, the camera aspect of it. So now we've, we've kind of blossomed from let's find the film site to let's put up a few cameras, which we started in 2012. Let's put up yes. a few cameras to see what wildlife is traveling through the area here. And, and uh, we've had some good good luck with the, with the yes uh, you know sasquatches but a lot well, of good wildlife footage yes it, it shows one how much hard work is still going on here right and uh, specifically you know Jamie and Rowdy hiking in here as early as possible and as late as possible yeah to have cameras running all winter which is you know a, a feat that would not have been possible much more than about 10 years ago with the available technology right uh, but these cameras work great and i'm so impressed with what we're seeing but just in general it's proving that you know this habitat can support a lot of large animals yes i mean we're seeing you know deer of course bear lots of bear lots of bear did i say lots of bear no no just say, say it again there's lots of bear that's right okay you lots of bear uh, a very healthy population of mountain lion and uh, you know on this trip we've seen elk sign that's right uh, and you know that is a very large animal like on the trip up this canyon we found elk prints on the way up mm. and just yesterday uh, I think it was, no, it was the day before yesterday I went for a little walk and I was flanked by a bear who would stop when I stopped when I moved he moved and then finally he just said hell with it kept moving and then he made his way down to the road that I was on and that's when I took my pepper spray out and kept walking <laughs> I never saw him but but it, but that was there and so there's lots of wildlife up here yeah and I have to point out here too that, you know a lesser bigfooting group would have uh, assumed that the bear was a bigfoot yes oh that's right a squatch being stalked by squatch but you know, the people with minimum outdoor experience you know would rush to the conclusion but you know yeah. the, the behavior was very consistent with the bear and we have seen so many bear in this area uh you know there's an old expression you know when you hear hooves think horses not zebras yeah you, know, you have to go Quote. with <laughs> you, you have to go with you know the obvious explanation i thought you were going to ask me robert well, how come the big brave boy, how come he didn't stay there and watch this bear crash through the brush and enter the road where you were standing? Oh, yeah. Well, why didn't you charge up into the brush after? <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard that. Well, why didn't you just run after the thing? Yeah, well. Because it's three times my mass. Well, that's what Matt and Over twice would do. as fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Matt Moneymaker would. Gotta get the shot. <laughs> well, I would be willing to. Uh, I'd be willing to bet uh, he'd be a little more cautious if there was real sign of Sasquatch, like the, like the terrible smell or things too large for a person to handle being tossed. Right. Uh, but yeah, someone's going to get the shot. I, I hope it's us. Yeah. But I, I truly want the shot to be made. I don't care who gets the credit. Right. There's far too many people who are, you know, thinking they're somehow going to get rich doing this, or and or they're still famous, thinking that, or, or or get revenge against all the people who doubted them. Oh. I, science doesn't work that way. Well, some people think the money is in the shows and the search. True, but uh, I mean, looking, there I'm will looking. be more. I mean, there'll be more shows, you know, afterwards after yeah. Discovery, but. Uh, yeah, we won't be in them. <laughs> no, no. It'll be real scientists. Well, it'll be the next Jane Goodall or uh, Diane Fossey. Oh, good. Well, I got just a few more things to ask you. And uh, one of those is, is there anything else you want to bring up that, you know, that concerns you or projects you'd like to get involved with or anything else of interest that we neglected to mention? Oh, well. Yeah. You know, I think there's still so much more work that can be done just in this area. And there's some just extraordinary areas nearby here in Northern California that are very scratchy. You know, the Russian wilderness, the Marble Mountains, the yeah. Trinity Alps. I mean, some of these areas 
besides being just stunningly beautiful, are right. also great habitat and do have a long history of sightings, very credible sightings, including sightings by you know, experienced outdoors people and even the Forest Service employees. So there, there's a lot of work to be done here. I mean, we've been here now 10 years, and I, I do think there's still Sasquatch activity in this canyon, in this drainage, but you know, no one has a credible explanation of when and where and why. That was one of the questions uh, I was going to ask you because um, I get asked that. When you're out and about, uh, have you seen any sign of Sasquatches? You have those cameras out. But we don't, as, uh, Jamie doesn't want us to hide the cameras in terms of camouflage. I like to camouflage them for years, so we always had the debate of how the, if you're not there for eight months to check them, debris could blow in the, and, and ruin your shots. But experiences of trying to justify it, because I know I personally had encounters with mild lion bears here. Uh, I tell a little story where I heard you know, women talking and laughing, you know, by the creek there. Oh, it's just the creek sounds. Uh, just, just, just last night, uh, our crew that was at the berm said something had knocked over a tree and was crushing in the brunch and wasn't going anywhere. And we heard that over the radio. And uh, so the question always comes up is, uh, you know, 1967, there was a sighting, you know, you had the guy in a suit or a sighting or whatever. And uh, mm. you think they're still here? I think there's still activity. I think they have to move through this drainage or, or the ridges around it. But, you know, no one has a good, credible explanation I mean, people have been looking for decades for you know, the, the solution to where you find Bigfoot. And uh, I, uh, I don't have anything better than what everyone else has done. Uh, but I know they're still in this region. I'm sure of it. Uh, I just think it's, you know, it's boots on the ground. <laughs> uh, you know, we need more people, more cameras, and more time out in the woods. So hiking, basic technically, uh, two miles to get here from mm. from the bottom, from the berm basically, about two miles to get here. And they're not easy miles, they're rugged miles. And while we're yes. traveling through here, we're in this narrow canyon with a few, you know, hillsides that come up. And it's a wild place. Oh, absolutely. This is, uh, this is, you know, untouched wilderness. I mean, I doesn't look like there's been any logging around this immediate area it's higher up on the ridges and right. places but this is this is old well the last thing i'm going to talk about because uh the book's coming out yeah wait for the book <laughs> yeah so this we're shooting for october november but of 2020 uh we're trying to get the book out and the, writing that book it's the last two years we've been busy with it looking for photographs looking for uh reviewing the video footage that we, we, we shot, all 72 10-minute blocks of that, going through it, deciding what was appropriate to share, what was not, to help paint the story of us over a two-year period of rediscovering, looking and applying mm -hmm. evidence and researching for it, and how we felt, and uh, besides we're still friends, you know, sometimes you have a cl class of personalities out there, like, like you were outvoted uh, two to one uh, on several occasions, and you were not yes, happy about most that. Most of the occasions. <laughs> you were not happy, but yet you're your trooper. You would yeah. disappear for a little bit and come back again, make sure we're still alive. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you you had your ideas too, but you used to were a contributor to this, Absolutely. To this process. Yeah. Uh, and every time you write a story and you have the, uh, the devil's advocate in the story, uh, where we'd always see eye to eye, you always wonder, is that going to end our relationship? You know, like, the uh, uh, reason I'm saying that now is because uh, um, he has been helpful. We're, we're moving it along, and I sent him a copy of the manuscript, and I, I don't hear from him for a month and a half. And I'm like, uh, is he alive? Uh, did he not like something he read? And so, as life has it for us, it, things keep you busy. And, which is good, he's back, we're talking, we got information for him, but... Um, I'm looking forward to you know getting that off my hands because mm -hmm. it was a way of we've shared our journey with videos and I've always I like to write and I've, always, I've got several books published but I always wanted to put it into a something you hold in your hand that you can pass on to your kids or whatever where it tells the story of your adventure and it's kind of a unique adventure in this day and age where 
you have experts not knowing about okay. something and you decide that you're gonna see if you can find it yes. and confirm it. And you're looked upon by these experts as who are you to think you mm. are smarter than us to figure it out. And so the outsiders get together, they said, let's do it. They go out and they do it. And they yeah. do it within a couple of years. Yes. And so, we're surprised it wasn't done earlier. Yeah, well, I, I think it was one of those things that, you know, everybody knows where it is, but no one can actually put, you know, a finger exactly there. Right. And obviously like you know, personal GPS units you know, haven't been around for too long. No. Uh, and the, the, the earliest ones, you know, in the 90s were both expensive and not very accurate. Uh, but now everyone expects, you know, to have exact Google Earth coordinates of, of everything. Yes. And everywhere they go. But that was definitely missing, you know, 15 or so years ago. Uh, you can't so apply, great. you can't apply the Google location to the GPS locations, they're not quite the same thing, we found out. Oh gosh, yes, at one point, I guess, uh, when we were starting out, I had four or five different coordinates and or, you know, screen captures from Google Maps. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> all of them were pretty much, you know, incompatible with each other. One was obviously a typo because it was it was approximately the film site, but displaced southwards about a mile and a half into a whole nother mountain, a whole nother drainage area. Uh, but you know, th that was what we were working with then. And yeah. you know, like you said, you know, we can come in and do this. It's, it's citizen science is what they call it. You know, we can come in and, and do the work and you know, reach valid conclusions, you know, regardless of what the experts say. Do you feel like a zealot? Oh, not at all. I'm, I'm deeply committed. <laughs> My wife says you guys are just a bunch of Bigfoot zealots. <laughs> I mean, you guys live, breathe, talk, and, and you go out and get together, and you talk about it. You talk on the phone about it. You get on the internet and talk about it. And so I guess I do qualify. I I never thought of it that way before, but I'm with you. We're just a group of guys who have a, a same mission which we've accomplished, but we developed a relationship and we're friends. Mm. And we still have other projects we do together. And there's more to be done, as you said in one of the interviews. You know, we scratched the surface, we found the film site. Uh, what next? You know, we talk about how, figuring out how many teeth mm. Patty had, you know, by, uh, you know, you know, just figuring out more stuff. Yes. So the last thing I'll leave with, just a reminder, the book's coming out. It's called The Bluff Creek Project, A Journey of Rediscovery, of the of the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film, and that will be available on Amazon yes. when it's published. Yeah, we're publishing um, through Amazon, and it's going to be uh, you can get it as a ebook, I guess, and electronically, which will probably be in color. I'm assuming, unless they just do that in black and white too. Yeah, I think it. Good question. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. I think that's color. I I got the ebook of uh, Munns. Yeah, is it in color? Book, yes. Well, it's it's in help. color, but he has got so many thousands of illustrations and uh, uh, photos in it. I, I would recommend getting his book in the hard copy. Yeah, collector's uh, item. Yes. And, uh, well, it's just easier to read. Versus but, looking at a tablet uh, yeah, or electronic or at least, version. At least looking at it on my phone, I couldn't, yeah. couldn't follow the pages. But I think, uh, uh, you know, most of... Most of your book is one photograph per page. Yeah, you know, in some so, places, yeah. So you think I should number the pages or, you know, just, yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it's just, uh, I don't have much experience with that, but I have noticed that sometimes uh, well, with the paper, you know, the hardback and soft cover versions of these classic Bigfoot books, the page numbers don't line up. So if you're trying to tell somebody, you know, you're trying to, quote something or footnote it you know there's a big difference say between the uh the original version of john green's on the track of the sasquatch and then the 70s and 80s pocket paperback I, I have a couple of, of those. the same yeah books. book one and book two uh exactly and so that they're uh that that is an issue uh i assume now 
with technology, they would have sorted that out so that the ebook has the same number of pages and things are on the same page as the hard copy. That, that's just a, a pet peeve of mine you know, for you know, the long winters when I'm not out in the woods. I'm reading or I'm, I'm tracking down rare copies of these books. And yeah, it's, it's quite frustrating when you're trying to document things and you realize that you know, someone else who grabs this book off of the library shelf isn't going to be able to find the quote or the page you're referring to uh, you know, when you're talking about it. But well, again, that won't be a problem for this book. Yeah. So be ready to buy it when it comes out in November or October. Yeah, we're going through Amazon. So they, they do uh, the e-books, they do the uh, hard copy books. They don't do hardcover, but they, yeah. they do the, the uh, one you can hold in your hand, which I'm traditional about, and then they have the e-books. Well, thank you so much for the interview. It's not every day you get to do interview at Scorp Scorpion Creek in the middle of a, a wild area with uh, they got butterfly just hanging around landing on you. Yeah, this is nice to reconnect and get out, and I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. Well, Ian, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's been great to be out here, and, uh, you know, interview me anytime. <laughs> oh, cool, I appreciate yeah, it. Now let's see what we've got on track for this afternoon. Yeah. All Maybe right a there. little exploring up into the hills. I think so. Well, great. thanks again. And oh, we, got, we, got, we got other people to interview as well, so appreciate it. Thanks. Gotcha.